Um, a, a little bit, before I dive into the talk, just a little bit of sort of grounding in, in what is this company that I'm talking about. Um, I am co-CEO of a company called Lean Kit. We are a visual management Kanban software company. We're based in Nashville, Tennessee, although I live in Wimbledon myself because I'm over here setting up our, our European operations. See about the size of the, the company. We do Lean and Kanban for big companies with complicated processes. So uh, Rolls-Royce, Jaguar Land Rover, Siemens, large banking firms, insurance. This is people who are doing Kanban for um, not to do doing done, but boards that have 100 lanes because you've all, you have all kinds of regulatory requirements, that kind of a thing. So, so we, do, we do enterprise Kanban, if you will. A um, little bit about me. Um, I am co-CEO. Uh, what, what that has meant over the course of, of the launch since we, we started my friend Steven's basement. I, I, you know, a little bit of sales, a little bit of marketing, product management, uh, product development, um, washing dishes, cleaning floors, all those kinds of things. Um, before that, uh, I had a career uh, in, in IT. Basically, I did um, business analysis, product management, project management. I was head of a PMO for a very large hospital company. Um, director of IT operations for a global uh, logistics and purchasing company. So uh, I'm talking here, I, I guess you might say, informed by my, exp I'm going to talk about the experience that I've had at LeanKit, um, but also I've, I've been you before, in, in essence, in, in your jobs. So this is, this is also informed by um, too many years and gray hairs of, of um, doing this kind of stuff. Okay. Um, so, in the fall of 2015, um, we had, or I should say, in the summer of 2015, we had successfully raised $12 million in venture capital financing from one of the top tier uh, VC firms in the US. Um, yay, we were very happy. Um, we hired a lot of people. Um, we bought a company to acquire some of the best developers that we knew in the technologies that we were, we were wanting to work on. We spent a lot of money. Um, and at the, at the, in the late fall, uh, sort of winter of that year, um, I didn't have a lot to show for that money as a, as a co-founder of the company. Um, instead, what I had was really smart technologists Rooms full of really smart technologists who hated each other, who yelled at each other, who would refuse to have meetings without me there so that I could veto, presumably, the other side of whatever argument was going to happen. Um, basically, I had a bunch of, it was, it's, a, it's dudes, um, I had a bunch of elephant seals slamming into each other to prove just how manly and tech smart they were. Um, and how the other guy is an idiot and, and, and should be fired and run out of the building. Um, so I'm spending a lot of money and I'm getting nothing, <coughs> getting nothing for it. And this is a really painful thing um, because, you know, when you raise money from VCs, one, we'd given up a pretty good chunk of the company. So my ownership in the company that at times had been supported by loans on my house that my wife had to co-sign um, and you know, paychecks that I'd paid out of my own wallet and those kinds of things. I had given this big chunk of this to VCs who were now saying, um, John, um, it's been six months. You talked about these things happening and these things are not happening. What's going on? Um, so this was, this was bad. Um, and we had to fix it. We had to figure out how to, how to make this work. And, and, I, and I start with that story because a lot of times when, um, so I, I guess maybe backing up a little bit, you know, I, I'm a lean guy from way back. I learned lean from the goal. Um, I learned lean in logistics seriously and things in warehouses and uh, order fulfillment and shipping stuff. So my coming to lean for IT was after I'd learned it from moving stuff and making stuff. So, you know, I'm a big believer in Lean. We had taught people in our company in Lean from the beginning. We had done all this stuff about Lean and Kanban. We sell Kanban software, for God's sakes. I go to conferences and I teach people about this stuff. And yet somehow, all of my dreams had come true, and I'd raised all this money, and supposedly we're going to be really productive, and there's bupkis happening. 
um, and I've got to figure out how to, how to fix this. Um, and, you know, the usual story when you talk about these things is, oh, management, management's in the way of us doing lean and agile because management are a bunch of distant jerks on the golf course and they don't understand technology and really the way agile works and all this kind of stuff. And yet, I'm the CEO. I'm, you know, washed in the blood of the agile, you know, like uh, I, I sing the hymns and all these kinds of things and yet it's not happening. So, this is a story where the, the, the opposition or the, the obstacles are not executive sponsorship or buy-in or management trying to make things happen. It's the fact that this is a big, big change for people. It's a huge change for people in their lives. And so I want to talk about sort of how we got to where people were okay with the change and then some of the things that we did, that, you know, we actually implemented along with this now this worked. So starting point. So I had the bull, you know, elephant seal slamming into each other. And, and, and we set up an offsite for these guys. And it was, you know, basically I was, I was, I was going to I was gonna have to force them to change. There's no way around this. I was going to have to force them to change. But how to do this in a way that was actually going to work. Um, and what I started with, and I think for anybody who's in a leadership position, you're trying to make an agile change, lean, Kanban, scrum, whatever, doesn't matter. This is a large cultural organizational change. And when you do that, you're going to have to ask people to give up things that they really believe in and admit that they've been wrong about things that they've been bragging they're right about, right? And probably banging on their chests and all that kind of thing. Like I said, dudes. Um, so uh, how do you get there? How do you get people, how do you get to where you can have that conversation? For me, the starting point was admitting that a large portion of the screw-ups were on my plate um, and that I was going to have to ask them to change, but also I was admitting that I had been wrong in a lot of ways and that I was going to have to change. And in some, way, in some cases, the things they were going to have to change were my fault, not their fault, and just there's no way around that. So when I first put some of these slides together, it was actually for them. This is a very condensed version of probably two hours of all the crap I had done wrong over the course of two years. I'm not going to take you through all of that. Um, but just a few examples, illustrative examples for you to sort of think about as you are trying to change your organization, how can you reveal some vulnerability to get people to do that? Um, one of the things was you know, talking with them was we had we actually had a lot of technical debt, lots of technical debt. Um, we'd been a startup. We had done stuff at two o'clock in the morning when we had other jobs, and you just did it whatever way that made it work so that you could sell the stuff. And it was spit and bailing wire, and some stuff only honestly worked because you restarted the servers every night and all that kind of a thing. And we, you know, we had been talking, you know, just chip it, we're going to fix it later. In many cases, we just didn't fix it later because we had bills to pay and we had to keep moving forward. And I had, I had to admit that, that the, the, the things that they were struggling through were, were my fault, maybe for good and valid reasons. On the money side of things, like I said, we had raised this money. Um, it took a long time. Um, if anybody, I don't know, has anybody else ever raised any VC financing or any, had to do raise financing even inside a company for a major project? Yeah. Um, however long you think it's going to take, even if you say it's going to take longer than you think it's going to take, you're wrong. It's going to take two or three times that long. Um, so it took us a long time. Um, raising, you know, when somebody's going to write a check for $12 million, that's a lot of money. They want to understand a lot of things. It takes a long, long time. Um, and yet you've got to keep running the business while that's happening because the only way you raise money is to show momentum and the only way that you have momentum is to keep doing things as if you had the money that you don't really have yet. Um, so, so, you know, that, that put a lot of strain on people. We had, during this time, where we, while we were raising VC financing from one of the biggest venture capital firms in the world, um, we had simultaneously been trying to negotiate partnership slash M&A type things 
with two of the largest software companies in the world. And when I say that, I'm not exaggerating. Um, one of them um, has a, uh, used to have a CEO who now likes to do global charity stuff, and the other one CEO likes boats. Um, so we, 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 were we were negotiating very large corporate uh, 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 relationships with two companies while we were raising this money. Um, one of those was actually a really, really good idea that didn't, act, didn't end up working. Um, the other one was stupid, partly because we didn't like the one that was actually going to work and we wanted somebody to play off of them. Um, but we were, you know, Kanban is all about limiting WIP. We were not limiting WIP at a strategic level. We were making all kinds of bets all over the place. And last of these anyway. Um, so startups love to talk about not having org charts, like it's a flat structure and we're all just partners in this grand adventure and all this. It's, it's a lie. It's garbage. Um, you know, it works because when you're a founder, everybody knows you're a founder and they defer to you and you don't have to have a title. It just sort of works because everybody knows. But that doesn't mean you're not the boss. Um, but what it, what it does mean, what it meant for us is, you know, this, we're a company that was started by four really good friends, um, former co-workers who'd known each other for years. We were very uncomfortable with the idea of titles, and especially we were very uncomfortable with the idea that eventually as things got bigger, some of us worked for the others. And among us founders, we just preferred to never draw an org chart because that was more comfortable and we didn't really need one. Um, but for people who worked for us, when there was like five other people who worked for us or 10 other people or 15 other people, you know, that kind of worked. Everybody just kind of knew how things worked and we knew most of those people. When you start getting to, you know, if anybody's ever been through sort of growth phases of a company, a company of five people is very different from a company of 15 people. A company of 15 people is very different from a company of 25, very different from a company of 50, very different from a company of 100. Doesn't seem like it. Those don't seem like big differences. They're huge differences in the way communication works. Um, look up um, n times n minus 1 over 2, which is the network of relationships within an organization, and see how that number grows. Um, but for us, we preferred not to put labels on things because we're startups and we don't need labels. Um, and it created a lot of confusion. So we had this situation where we had people working like a dog, racking up technical debt. Um, we didn't have enough money to go around to make things happen and yet things had to happen. We're trying to manage these giant partnership kinds of things, some of which require you to build features which actually don't relate to what you can sell but you need them for the partnership lack of role clarity, just all kinds of garbage. We had, we had just piled up garbage upon garbage on people. So your mea culpas may vary. They probably do. But what I would suggest to you is anytime you're trying to make a large change, and I'm not talking about you know, sort of like, hey, we're going to spin up an agile team. But if you're trying to make a department go agile, if you're trying to make a whole company go agile, it's a major change. This is a major social change. You're asking people to give up titles and things that they've understood and been comfortable with, things they're secure with, their position, their power, all those kinds of things. It's a big thing. Being willing to say the reason we need to do this is real, and I'll get to some of those things. And also part of the reason we need to do this, part of the change that needs to happen is in me, the leader, um, goes a long way towards uh, helping these conversations go on. Okay, so a lot of admitting I was wrong. I'm pretty good at that by now. Um, the next thing was helping people really understand how our business works. This is hugely important. So Agile is about delegating decision making. It's about saying instead of doing a lot of big upfront planning at the top and then just saying do these tasks, instead it's about saying, hey, individual teams are going to have backlogs, portions of the product that they own. We're going to delegate to product owners, product managers, and you guys are going to run things. Right? That's not just an execution thing, that's a decision making thing. And if the people that you're delegating that decision making don't understand how your company works, they're going to make dumb decisions that are going to get you in trouble. 
So for us, this is an example of this, it was helping our people understand, in essence, the financial model of our company. So we are a SaaS software company. People pay us on a monthly or annual recurring revenue basis. What that means is that money today, a sale today, is way more valuable than a sale next month, than a sale after that, than a sale after that. Because I, if I make a sale now, I don't just make the sale now, I make it next month and the month after and the month after and so on. Um, the other thing that they needed to understand was that we're an enterprise software company. We sell fundamentally to large, we sell lots of seats in relatively few companies. So instead of selling freemium to you know, 10 people in thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of companies, we sell, to thou we sell thousands and tens of thousands of licenses in hundreds or thousands of companies. So it's an enterprise kind of a thing. So for us, what that meant, and this is, by the way, sort of end of 2014, end of 2015, end of 2016, so on, and this is X number of seats, 2X, 4X, 8X. We had people, when we first hired them, who, hey, this is a SaaS startup. This thing's growing fast. They've just v raised VC revenue. This is going to be like Facebook, right? So I'm going to, I've got to build architecture that's going to support millions of people spread all over the world. I've got to build this giant bulletproof thing that'll scale forever. No, you don't. For us, if we're doubling the, the amount of, actually it's not even the number of users because we're adding features and raising the price point per seat. So this is not even necessarily doubling of users, it's doubling of revenue, doubling of revenue, doubling of revenue. If we can do that, our VCs are fantastically happy. They're very happy. We've hit all of our numbers. You don't have to worry about covering, you know, hundreds of times as many users in a year or two. So understanding the, the fact that, yes, this is going to scale, but it's going to scale arithmetically, not geometrically, matters a lot. And then also, again, that in terms of revenue, we've got this revenue target, this green line here, um, where we were when we were having this conversation was towards the end of 2015. And basically we were saying we were off on our target line to our, um, our actual line. At the time it was by about 100,000 uh, monthly recurring revenue. Um, and people were saying like, oh, well, that's not that much. You know, we'll make it up next month. Or we'll make it, you know, like if you just give us a few months to build this, you can sell a lot six months from now and you'll catch up from that. And what we were saying was that's not the way it works. If we're off by this now, we're actually already off by this over the course of three years. That's money. This gap between those things is money we're never going to get back. And you have to understand that. The other thing that they had to understand was that this is a VC backed thing. We had raised money in here. We were fully intending, and we have, raised more money here. Well, the only way you raise more money is if you've hit targets. Also, so you've got fundamental questions is, A, just can we raise money? Because if you've missed the targets badly, no, the door is closed, you get no more money. If you, you've done okay, but not as well as you should have, then that can be a significantly different price for the shares that you're selling. So a difference between a 4x multiple and a 6x multiple of revenue is a lot of money. And so that matters a whole lot for people to make their decisions. And then also, if they didn't really want to buy, and, and everybody within our company has shares, by the way, and so, so we're trying to help them understand what does this mean for them personally, but we were also trying to help them understand um, just bottom line is, most of the time, things do not go like this. If you're missing a little bit, it doesn't stay on this straight line where you miss a little bit. Generally speaking, if you begin missing a little bit, things flatten out. You have virtual cycles and you have vicious cycles in terms of the way companies work. And if you're in this flattening revenue kind of a perspective, you know, if you're up here hitting your targets and you're a developer, you get to do cool, neat stuff with the newest technology. And when somebody says, hey, can we try this new thing to build this cool new feature? The bosses say, absolutely, yeah, do that. If you are in this situation where revenue is flatlined, the answer is no, keep doing it the way you've been doing it, keep doing it with the old technology. We have to build the thing that the other people built because we've got to catch up. And that's not nearly as fun. 
So whatever your business model is, as you delegate decision making, you have to delegate the tools for making decisions, not just say, hey, run a backlog and, and you know, hope you do well. You've actually got to help them understand. You, ha you have to get them thinking like a business owner. One of the things we had to talk about was our principles um, and how some of those things were non-negotiable. So Agile will talk a lot, the world of Agile talks a lot about um, self-organizing teams, right? Self-organizing teams decide what they're going to do. Um, yes, but within boundaries. And if, if you're in a situation where, uh, I'll just say this, uh, I guarantee that there are boundaries. You may not know what they are, you may not see them, but there are boundaries. You're, you're not, you know, your company is not an autonomous collective. It's a company. It has revenue targets. Somebody owns it. There are rules. And so understanding here are the things that are negotiable. They're self-organizable. Here are the things that just aren't. And you need to understand that now rather than tripping over those wires and later and getting in trouble. So for us, what this was, was, was lean. It's in the name of the company. We believe in this firmly. These are things that we were going to do. Um, and that, you know, that there's just no way around it. We were going to do these things. And if you didn't believe in these things, this wasn't marketing material for us. It's why we had started the company. And so if you didn't believe in these things, you should fi probably find another, another place to be. And I've got other talks where I walk through lean principles. So I would just say the bottom line for us is these were real deep things that informed all of the decision making that we were doing and they needed for them. Kanban. We're a Kanban company. We sell Kanban software. We expect people to do Kanban. For us, this is our software development teams. It's our operations teams. It's our finance and accounting teams. It's our marketing teams. It's our sales teams. We visualize work so that we can better control it. Again, not negotiable. Um, so, you know, this was just an important part of, you know, how you apply lean in your team, in your department, quite negotiable. How you apply Kanban and you build your board to visualize your process, totally negotiable and should be continuously evolving as you learn, but you're going to do it. And for us, this sort of goes into, again, the idea of sort of understanding the business model. There was a sort of an encapsulation of several of those things that we use, which we call FizzGood. And this, this, is, this here is WFSGD, which is a joke on US radio stations. Um, here's a way you can win a pub quiz. Um, if you are west of the Mississippi River in the United States, radio stations start with K. If you are east of the uh, Mississippi River in the United States, they start with W unless the radio station was founded before about 1935, in which case they can be sort of all over the place. So there's some, there's some old ones that are, that are in the wrong place. Um, so there you go, if you use nothing else. Um, so FizzGood is frequent, small, good, decoupled. So this was an encapsulation of decision-making framework that we provided to all of our teams for how we wanted them to think about things. And this picture of a radio tower, thus the radio call sign there, was meant to help them understand of those things, which was the, the defining thing, the true north. And for us, that's frequency of delivery. If you are a SaaS software company, frequent delivery gives you repeat customers. Because SaaS software customers, they don't buy the product you make now, they buy the promise of what you have now plus what they believe your roadmap is for the future and your pace of delivery on those things. And so you can't deliver occasionally, infrequently, slowly. You've got to frequently deliver new stuff for them. That's what keeps them coming back. So frequent delivery for us was true north. Um, in order to do that, we needed to decouple things. So decoupled teams, decoupled technical architecture, decoupled decision making, so on and so forth. In doing that, you need to maintain a balance of good enoughness, 
which is always a tension between marketability, the good things that customers ask for on the list of features, and sustainability, which is all the things they never ask for, but if they don't get them, they leave and you can't, you can't actually run the product. So sales and marketing is always asking for good marketable things. Support and operations are constantly reminding you that you have to do the good sustainable things. Otherwise, the radio tower is just gonna fall down on the customer eventually. And the balancing act for how you actually make all of that work is to make things small. So if you are going to deliver frequently, you need to have decoupled teams, decoupled design, delivering good enough stuff, each increment of which is as small as you possibly can make it. So for us, understanding that, you know, if you remember nothing else about lean and Kanban and batch size and all these other kinds of things, that FizzGood was the how people needed to think and act and make their decisions. And this was very hard. This was actually very, very hard. Um, for people, we, you know, we had people in our marketing department who would talk about, well, that's fine, John, for story slicing, for software development, all those kinds of things. But you can't FizzGood your way to design. Yeah, you can. I used to work in newspapers. Um, I worked at a daily newspaper for, for many, many years. We came up with a newspaper design every day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. It was good enough design. If you wanted things to be better, you made it better in the second edition, the third edition, next day's edition, the online kind of a thing. So helping people understand, I can't tell you how many times people would say, well, yeah, but that doesn't apply to architecture or that doesn't apply to marketing, or that doesn't apply to uh, event management, or whatever it might be. Yeah, it does. Um, for, so coming up with what it, what, so when you say good enough, what does that mean? This part is gonna be different for different parts of the organization. So this is an example for our development teams. For them, uh, the G of FizzGood is broken out as TLDR, as in like too long didn't read. Uh, you know, text messaging, which is most people's documentation about quality standards. Nobody's ever actually read it since it was first written. Um, so we, we basically said was, for something to be good enough in a technical sense, it has to have um, some amount of test coverage. It doesn't have to have perfect test coverage, but there has to be test coverage in place. Logging has to be there. Documentation at some level has to be there. And some process of review has to be, in, be there. Not perfect. But if you have at least some modicum of all of those things in place, you can build into a better place later. If you lack these things, then you're stuck in a situation where you actually can't get better later. You don't have the, the framework that allows you to do that. So, so again, this is for our software development teams. Our IT ops people had different ones. Our marketing people had different ones. But coming up with that, what is the good enough standard was really, really important. One of the things that we we, we said was that, you know, we were scaling the organization, we were hiring a lot of people, we were building a lot. People had to understand, though, that we couldn't just continue indefinitely hiring new ops people to babysit things. We were not going to main, we were not going to stay as a profitable um, or at least a fast growing startup company if we couldn't automate things appropriately as we scaled. Um, and in, in Lean, this is referred to as Jadoka or automation. For people who know anything about DevOps, you may have heard the, um, the, the metaphor of uh, pets versus cattle. People familiar with that idea? A, a, a few. Okay, so this is, uh, I'll, I'll relate it to, um, well, to servers. Um, so, well, actually, let me, let me start, I'll start here with the, with the pets and cattle themselves. So if we have pets, we love our pets. We love what's different about our pets. Because um, not only, these aren't just dogs, they're different kinds of dogs, and we love them in very different ways. And the dog's totally different from a cat, which is a fish. We just love them for their differentness. Um, and we love them so much that we will pay stupid amounts of money to heal them, even though they don't do anything for us other than, you know, take up the whole side of my bed so that I've got no place to put my legs. But we love them, and it's why we have them, because we love them, we take care of them. On the other hand, and I say this as the, the, the son of the son of, uh, of a cattle farmer um, and who, who uh, tagged uh, uh, cow's ears and fixed fence when I was a kid, um, you do not love your cows. 
other than the one blind cow that you keep by the house and you feed salt licks to and you call Bessie, even Bessie eventually goes to the slaughterhouse because the point of cows is either milk or meat. And even if it's milk, eventually it's meat. Um, sorry to the vegetarians. But I mean, that's the point. That's why you have cows. That's their purpose. Now, you do take care of them. You've got people whose job it is to take care of the cows and protect them from coyotes and watch over them. And you will heal them if you can. However, if they get sick, seriously sick, and especially if they're at any risk of hurting any of the other cattle, the same pistol that you use to protect them with, you will shoot them mercilessly. And you will drag them away with the truck and you will get more cattle. Because the cattle don't have names, they have ear, except for Bessie. Um, they have ear tags with numbers because their purpose is meat. I have 200 head of Angus cattle. If I lose 20, I get 20 more. I don't care where they came from, whatever. It's a money making thing because the purpose is meat. So relating that to IT, when you start any kind of a technology thing, each one of our technology thing servers is special and different, and it's a unique snowflake that we love. So, so you know, our server named Darth Vader was set up in this way, um, and Darth Vader is totally different from Grimace. Um, that we set up the next year when we had changed our naming convention because those Star Wars nerds, they're all gone and we can give McDonald's nerd names to things now. Um, and so each one is different. And when there's trouble, we treat them with loving care because everybody knows that such and such runs on Grimace. And Grimace is a little bit different than Darth Vader. And so the way you make that work is you hold your tongue out and you turn the lights off twice. Um, and then you run this script and that fixes Grimace. Um, but it would never fix Darth Vader because some other jerk made Darth Vader earlier and it's totally different. Um, so they're, they're different, right? We have, it's, it's special. Everything's special and unique. And we have to handle it in a special and unique way. And as there's problems, we have to fix those things in a special and unique way. As we scale up technology, you have to move to a situation where your servers are cattle. When there's a problem with one of them, you don't try to fix it you shut it off and you spin up another one because you've got it in config, you've got it containerized, all these kinds of things. You just, you, you destroy three of them, you spin up four more and you're done. Um, you, you, you are cattle ranchers, you're not uh, pet vet veterinarians. So uh, pets versus cattle. So how do you get there? How do you get to this nirvana state of, of, of cattle? Um, well, partly it's through planning. You've got to figure out a process by which you're going to uh, retire Grimace and retire Darth Vader and figure out your standard uh, convention for how these things are going to run. And there's, there's a lot of planning and so on. The planning will be imperfect and you're never going to get there through planning. A lot of the way you're going to get to how this stuff really works and works right is when you have problems and by fixing the problems and by wi being willing to actually fix the real problem and not just patch it when it comes along. And so a lean concept that, and, and um, this is something that's very hard to actually get going. So there's a, there's a lean concept called Andon, which is in factories, there's a, a button or a cord that's above every workstation and every worker has the right, the right, the duty, the responsibility to pull that cord to stop the line when they see a problem. And, and the idea is when that happens, People swarm over to fix the problem, figure out why the problem happened in order to get the line running and make sure that that kind of problem never happens again. Um, I, I say this from personal experience. Also, you know, the, the people will say like, oh, I've seen this in pictures. Uh, I and several of my coworkers, my, my co-founder uh, co Daniel worked in a milk bottling plant um, when he was in college and, and really did this and had the button and when you know the, the the plastic bottles would fall on the floor and they would swarm over and kick them out of the way and all that kind of a thing. Um, but this is easy to say, it's very, very hard to do. People feel tremendous social pressure to keep the line running, to hit targets, to hit dates. And the only way that you actually get people to be willing, so they feel that pressure and at the same time though, if you were constantly just fixing the immediate problem, you're never solving the underlying problem and therefore you're going to keep having these same problems happen over and over. So, you know, there, there's, there's often a tremendous unintentional or unspoken pressure on employees, sometimes from middle management, about keeping the line running. 
where a senior management really needs the line to work in a healthy way on a continuous basis. And so for me personally, this required a lot of times where I was the one who stopped the line. I would watch lean kit boards, I would watch Slack, I would walk over to people's desk and listen to what, was say, what, what they were saying, and I would say, hey guys, this, this, this kind of sounds like a stop the line, doesn't it? Well, no, John, I think we can, are you sure this has happened like three times in the last week? Are you sure we don't need to stop? Well, no, I think we can, no, I think we're going to stop the line. And we would stop the line and we would dig in, because what you're really trying to do is really root cause solve things so that you can get to this state of automation, of autonomation. One of the things that we put in place, and I would actually say it's a pretty important part of really effectively working in a lean and agile way, is creating cross-functional teams. So this is the labels I'm using are from the Spotify model. Um, you're, you, you, know, you don't have to use those if you, um, if you don't want to. Our sales teams call themselves pods instead of squads for some reason. Um, whatever, whatever works for you. Um, so the basic idea here is that rather than creating temporary project teams, ad hoc project teams for every, every different product, project, um, what you do is you create standing permanent teams in our case, this was based on sort of technology stack for web development, mobile analytics, architecture and tooling platform and so on, that that was people's primary team. And then you had this cross-cutting consideration of the technical specialty that they belong to. That was, that's guilds. So this, this is actually expressing that a little bit, um, maybe a little bit better. So a squad is intended to be you know, that sort of uh, seven plus or minus two. The idea is that this, this group has 80% of the skills required to deliver whatever they do from start to finish. People can only belong to one squad. Um, you're not time slicing people working across multiple projects. They are located together and work gets assigned to the squad, not to the squad members. So you assign work to the team, the team figures out how to do work. You don't pull people and say, hey, you do this work. That's not the job of the manager. The manager's job is to run the system, not to parcel out work. You do have this cross-cutting consideration of the guild, which is the technical specialty. So this is the hiring, training, standards, tech, you know, technical standards, mentoring of people and their skills, so that even though dude is this, he can be badass this when he's in his squad. Um, so, by the way, um, I, I guess I, should, I, I, I didn't clearly delineate. This is, in essence, probably where you stop the principles and we're getting into the, the practices um, and sort of what evolved. And, and, and I, this is not um, like there was not one holy moment where we just said we're going to do all these things and it works. This is an evolution over the course of six to nine months to get here. You know, in essence, sort of, we had that, um, uh, you know, coming together moment, alignment moment around the principles, and then it was, okay, now let's figure out the practices that are actually going to make this work for our teams. And that's, so these things are more about the practices that we adopted. Um, I feel very, very strongly about lean principles and Kanban. The particulars of these kinds of practices, your results may vary. Um, Squad rooms, though, but I, I, but I would say these are, these are some good things that, that do actually work very well. Um, squad rooms. So this is something that we actually reconfigured our building to make this work, the, de the building where our developers work. Um, there's, there's this debate often between is our open spaces better or our private offices better? So the, the open space camp um, is all about sort of collaboration, like it's like the, the, the uh, creative ferment and collaboration of everybody being out in a room and together and so on. Um, I think often it's really more like about costs because if you can have people in a big room at small desks, you can pack more people in less square footage. Um, but nevertheless, you know, it's creative, creative ferment and collaboration, right? On the other hand, people will say like, but I'm truly productive when I'm by myself in a dark room with a closed door and nobody else can bother me because I can just churn out code and I can just be the badass developer that I was born to be if those product managers would only just leave me alone. Well, your job is not to churn out code. Code by itself is worthless. Individual people don't, re rarely, 
in any kind of company of size, individual people don't do anything that actually results in a final product. The final product is almost always a collaboration of multiple team members. So your productivity in your room by yourself is not the relevant way of measuring productivity. But also, on the other end, a large room with lots of people, yes, it may be lots of people talking, but is it actually collaboration? So me talking with my team members about the thing that we are working on, that's collaboration, that's useful. Me listening to some JA talk about what he did over the weekend or his car, um, who's on some total other team and I don't really like the guy, that's not collaboration, it's just noise. I want it to go away. So for us, what we said was, so what's the balance here? And what we did was we ended up rebuilding our building so that we have a series of rooms, each of which is able to hold about eight to 10 people. Um, they have um, glass walls on one wall facing each other. Um, they have glass door, so basically you can see if you need to get in and so on, or people can see out if there are people waiting on them. But if you need to, you can close the door so that when the team wants things to be private. But if they're, if they're happy for it's sort of like office hours and people can come visit them, they open up the door and all the teams can circulate amongst themselves. But we, we found tremendous benefit of sort of balancing collaboration and privacy. Because my team members, that's real collaboration. I don't mind them talking. I'm interested in those things. Stand-up desks, you know, we, we're, we're a startup, right? Those are cool. Um, one of the things that we did was we put large screen TVs with cameras on all the walls um, so that um, in some cases we've got remote team members and that way those remote team members can in essence be in the room all the time. They can just leave those cameras on all the time when they're having meetings. Um, one of the things that we did, by the way, um, worth thinking about um, is, and this is definitely something that we evolved to, was um, creating in essence, physical teams, and in other cases, remote teams, rather than having a mix of those things. So what, what we found was if you had a team that was like five or six people who were physically together and two or three people who were remote, the people who were physically together were, actually it didn't even matter. Even if you had like two or three or four of the people physically at the office and the other six people were remote, the people who were physically together in the office ended up being treated as the real team, and that's who got collaborated with, versus the remote, mem remote team members. They were some people somewhere who, who never got listened to. So what we did was we had, we had to look at this and say, how can we align people so that you had as much as possible, this team are all physically co-located, or these, this team is all remote? Because if everybody's remote, it actually works pretty well. No, you know, everybody's on a level playing field. And people who, you know, at headquarters who need to reach out to that team, they know that that team's remote and that's how they reach them. Um, we began road mapping. Um, and this is, so we're, we're a Kanban company. We sell Kanban software. Um, we do continuous delivery. And I, I really do mean, you know, many, many releases per day, per product all the time. We're continuously releasing. And yet, there is a value to predictability. There is a value to understanding a cadence of delivery and so on. So what we did was we established what we call um, sweep, six week execution and evaluation periods. We divided the year up into sweeps. And what we, what we do is we establish a headline per team per sweep. And what we try to do is we try to, you know, you've got things in the past that you're measuring, the thing you're working on right now, we aim to have uh, concept documents, we call that an A3 and mock-ups for the next sweep, a concept document for the sweep beyond that, and then beyond that's really just themes. So trying to find a balance between predictability and, and something sales teams could hang their hats on versus the ability to change our mind and deliver continuously. Um, this is what we use, this is, this is just one example of um, A3, literally, for, for anybody who's heard this lean term and wondered if it, this is like a technical thing, A3 literally is the size of the sheet of paper. It's just an A3 sheet of paper. There is no standard format for A3s. The fundamental, well actually, where, where A, again, pub quiz story for you. Where did A3 come from? So Taiichi Ono, who was the head of product development for Toyota back in the, in the 60s and, and so on, um, had a habit 
when he would get given uh, reports by his subordinate executives, he would only read the first page. And after he'd read the first page, he would say, well, let's go see. Um, and so they learned that if they were actually going to get him to read anything, it all had to be on the first page, which meant the first page had to be big. And he had to condense as much as possible and make it really sort of summarized and thematic. And so for us, what we're trying to do is we're trying to establish what's the business problem to be solved, not a technical specification. What is this? Why do we care? Who is this about? Maybe how are we going to do it? The market, why? Any kind of sort of got choose, but really, really trying to make this um, very summary. One of the things we do is um, we generally do this as handwriting um, because uh, you can't cut and if it's very easy to not read what you cut and paste versus it's very hard to not read what you actually write. If you write something, it actually goes through your brain um, and you actually have to think about it. So A3 concept documents. Um, so those six week evalu uh, execution and evaluation period, um, that all of our teams are on the same six week cadence. So this is not like uh, sprints where it's like, well, this team's on a two week sprint, and this, this team's on a four week sprint, and this team does one week sprints. All of our teams are in a six week cadence. Um, you might have realized, and, and we lock this to the calendar, which you might understand because of, you know, the earth doesn't work perfectly that way. That doesn't actually line up. There's, you know, 52 weeks in a year plus sleep days and so on. Um, happily, however, the end of the year, especially in the U.S., has Thanksgiving and it's got Christmas and lots of holidays. So the truth is it actually does work out pretty well to eight periods where you've got about six working weeks. Um, and, and what we've done with this is we actually have where um, a couple of times a year, everybody in the company comes together at headquarters during that time. Leaders come once a quarter during that time. We do annual kickoff and a mid-year party. We've aligned our board meetings to this schedule. So this takes a tremendous amount of work, but if you can actually align these things like this, it makes scheduling really easy after that because you don't actually have to think. Everybody just knows who's going to be where on particular days. And I do really mean particular days. Um, so this is within a particular sweep. How does this work? There is a theme for each week within the six weeks. So you've got the pull planning week, which is the week where everybody is physically together doing lots of training and planning and thinking and whiteboarding and running around and changing plans and all these kinds of things. The idea being, if you must have chaos, do all your chaos at once. It's very, very tiring, but it gets a lot of stuff done very, very productively. The week after that, we don't want to be in a mode where Scrum often works out where you've got the continuous death march, where it's like a four-week four week death march followed by another four-week death march followed by another four-week death march. Um, and so what we've intentionally done is we do have a four-week period during which this is, in essence, roadmap working weeks over here. But we have this week of planning that's a pause on that stuff. And the week immediately after, intentionally before the roadmap work, we have either what we call squad-driven work or a hackathon week. Um, and basically, the, the way this worked out, is we, and this is, this is the result of this didn't initially work this way. So lean people will often talk about Slack. Slack is a good thing, it's creative, and you know, all these kinds of things. It's actually very hard to generate Slack, and it's very hard to generate Slack in a way that's useful. Um, we were running into a situation where um, teams, I have Slack, but you don't. I want to work on something, but you're not available right now. Um, I, I'm trying to rush to get something done, you're very busy, you know, all these kinds of things. So, so you know, the, the original intent was that we were going to set aside sort of 20% time all the time for Slack, and it just never worked, it never happened. And so what we did instead was we said the week immediately after a poll planning, instead of diving right into roadmap work, this is the, in essence, this is Slack week. This is the week for you to work on uh, whatever you want whatever you want as a team. So hackathons are whatever I want to work on as an individual because I think it's neat and cool. Squad-driven work has to be a consensus of the team, what's valuable for the team. So it's not roadmap stuff. It's not stuff management's asking for. It's stuff we think is the right thing to work on based on code quality or refactoring or maybe some small features nobody ever asks us to build and we don't understand why because they'd be really easy and cool and we just want to build those things. Um, 
But, but basically, it's a week during which they can work on whatever they, they want to. They don't have to ask permission so long as they can agree upon it as a squad. And sometimes it's actually multiple squads because by doing this at the same time across all the squads, they can actually work together if there's an opportunity to do this. So this is something that's worked out really well for us. One of the things that really helped us with is it's very, it's usually very easy to build the business case for a marketability feature. Um, you know, there's somebody from marketing or sales or product management who can tell you all the ways we're going to make money from this new feature, right? Um, Sometimes it's very hard to build the business case for a sustainability feature. And you can't just do, I mean, obviously you want to build, do clean code as much as you can all the time, build things right, keep your space clean, all those kinds of things. But there's certain sustainability things which are projects. But how do you justify those projects? Well, one of the things we found, and this wasn't intentional, but by creating this squad-driven work time, this actually allowed some of our squads to use that time in essence to spike sustainability things in order to develop the business case and then come to management and say, hey guys, here's the actual numbers for why we need to do these sustainability things, at which point it becomes much easier for us to improve, approve those things. So squad-driven work. Um, the, way, the way we work um, during, the, during this poll planning week is at the beginning of the week, in essence, there's a meeting where the leads, product managers and technical leads from all the teams come together and say, this is what I think we're going to be working on. Going into this week, this is what I think is the most valuable thing. Does, anybody, does everybody understand that? Does anybody have any concerns? Are there dependencies here? Are there any technical issues we need to think about? Or do we need to resequence? All those kinds of things. And, and you sort of resolve those things. The teams then go into planning for several days you know, just you know, sort of locked in, locked in a room with pizza and just, just whiteboarding and, and all kinds of things, sort of thinking through, if that's what we want to do, how might this work? They're not trying to break out all the work for the whole time and commit to particular days for delivery or whatever. What they're trying to identify is, in essence, risks, technical impediments, dependencies on other teams, all those kinds of things. What, what's, what's all the stuff that might trip us up later Let's get that out now so that while everybody else is doing the same thing, it's much easier to resolve those things as opposed to once everybody gets started, if I then raise my hand and say a problem, people say, well, okay, can you wait till next poll planning? Because we're kind of busy with other stuff right now. Um, so each team, each squad goes into their planning. And then what we do is we do readback presentations where each squad comes and presents to myself um, and the other heads of, of technology. And what we try to do is not have the product manager or the technical leads do the presentation. We try to have the whole team do the presentation back to the leadership because we actually want to understand that people actually hear, they've heard, they actually understand, and they're okay with what they're presenting. We want to understand that they've actually sort of bought into this as opposed to having it forced down their throat. So we, we take a, a very standardized approach to this, um, have, a, have a standardized checklist and presentation thing where we try to, to walk through all those things. We ask them about what squad-driven work they're going to do, what things they think they might be able to demo, when are they having retro stand-ups, all those kinds of things. So measurement. Um, measurement's a, a, a dangerous thing. Um, you need to measure, and yet, uh, you know, people will tell you, you know, if you, you know, if you can't manage what you can't measure. At the same time, um, if you tell me how you're going to measure me, I'll tell you how I'm going to behave, and sometimes that's not actually how, what you want. So, so measurement is both useful, but it's also actually pretty dangerous. And so thinking about, you know, how, how are you going to measure um, is, is important to think about. So we ask our teams to measure cycle time, variability, all kinds of things. It's relatively easy using our tool. Um, but, but that's for them. That's for them to, inter uh, to, to, to do internal process improvement. What we ask them to measure for us, what we, what we said were the metrics for us at the leadership level were two things. One is the ability to demo and the other is the number of deployments. So the first thing is the, the, the ability to demo. So we have a standard demo time for all the squads at the same time, Tuesday mornings every other week. Um, basically, each squad gets a certain amount of time. They stand up, they demo, they demo whatever they got done. 
Um, we ask them to take an approach where they talk about what, so what, now what. So it's not just demoing the technology, it's trying to explain to the whole organization. The entire organization is invited to this. Um, basically, hey, what, what, what's the cool stuff you've released and why should I care? What is this going to do for customers? We didn't put any rules in place for this other than it's going to happen on Tuesday mornings. Everybody's going to get time. They've got to talk about this and this format. We wanted to get to eventually where they were only demoing things that were actually in production. But at first it was just demo stuff. Eventually we started, and actually I think one of the squads did this, they started doing a red, yellow, green light about something that was red was they were demoing it even though it was still in dev. Um, yellow was in dog food, which is like our integration environment. And green was in prod. So they sort of started reporting on where things were in the, in the process. By social pressure, eventually nobody wanted to demo anything that was red or yellow. They only wanted to demo green because the other teams were demoing green. Um, and, and, and they wanted to demo something. So, so again, there was no standard on what it needed to be to be demoed, um, other than you might say the applause meter. Right? So you get five or ten minutes, you get to stand up and you get to talk about things, and you want people cheering and clapping and asking questions about the cool thing you did. If you don't get those things, you know, sad face. Um, so, you know, what we, we, we basically created a, a venue where you had to show stuff, but there were really no particular rules other than the sort of communal desire to do well and to appear well. It worked very, very effectively. The other thing that we measured was, so you might say, is that really a measure? Well, yeah, I mean, basically it's a yes, no sort of equation about whether each team had something to demo uh, each time. The other thing we demo or we, we started measuring was the number of deployments. Um, and this, we, at first we made the terrible mistake of showing each team on the chart. We were not actually comparing them to each other. They were convinced we were, um, and, and they were very mad about that. Um, so don't do that. Don't compare team velocities of whatever type of velocity to one another because it's nonsensical. They're working on different types of stuff on different technology stacks with different number members of people in the teams. It doesn't make sense to measure them against one another. All we did was measure a particular team and then the total trend line. And really the goal was just that the thing would be going up. We wanted to have more deployments per time period over time. Um, But not really. We didn't actually, I don't care what number of deployments. I, I, I don't care at all what the actual number is. However, I know that if you deploy more, deploy more stuff in bits, if you are continuously deploying bits, you're in much better position to do this. The other thing I know is that if, you ha if you're trying to deploy more and more often, you are going to be forced to reduce the friction of deployment or deploying is going to be a royal pain. Reducing the friction of deployment has all kinds of benefits in terms of code quality, repeatability, sustainability of your environment, resilience, and all those kinds of things. So one of the things we had happen was we said, hey, we're going to start measuring the number of deployments. And they said, well, how do you define a deployment because a, a, you know, a, a BI team works different from the dev team? I said, I don't care. Just come up with whatever your standard is. As long as you keep it, just use it. Um, but, you know, it, it worked. The other thing they said, well, John, you know, all we would have to do to cheat on this is we would just break things down into smaller pieces and we would get more deployments. So I can totally game this system. <laughs> cool, do that. Game the system. Totally, yeah, totally game the system. Uh, I didn't care. I mean, it's, uh, again, I didn't actually want the high number, but if they're trying for the high number, they're going to be forced to find those things in the technology stack that are blocking them from doing more deployments because they're not just going to increase the number of deployments when it becomes a pain in the butt, right? Um, so by measuring, by measuring deployments, we decreased deployment friction, which gave us more and more ability to demo incremental value which got them applause and cheers, which created this feedback loop, um, which was tremendously valuable. So by measuring two things which were pretty unscientific and it's sort of pick whatever scale you want, but by doing this on a consistent basis for a while, and actually we've stopped doing de deployments because it actually got so easy it didn't matter anymore. 
Um, so also be okay with that. Don't fall in love with your metrics. Abandon them when they, when they stop being useful. Okay, so um, cool. Uh, so, you know, all neat things, John, um, whatever. D does this actually accomplish anything? Um, well, so prior to beginning this journey, like I said, I'd raised a lot of money and I was getting nothing, seriously nothing. I'd had six months without a serious deployment. Um, subsequent to these changes and at an increasing pace, we had 12 months where we hit our roadmap in terms of what are the headlines we're going to deliver each sweep on all teams other than one time where I forced to stop the line and a couple of times where we made deliberate roadmap insertions or in essence executive scope uh, increases but not team overruns. Um, much higher product quality, significantly higher product quality, way less rework among teams, um, significantly better morale. People were pretty pissed and unhappy before that. Much happier within product development, also with the business side of the house, much, much better relationships. Um, that sweep cycle, which at first is something we just did for our product development teams, eventually our marketing team started following it, our sales team started following it, it really became a company opportunity, it's been hugely beneficial. And for me, one of the things that it really made happen, um, or for all the executive team, but definitely for me, is that I got way more time to focus on strategy and running the business and had to spend way less time listening to uh, technical leads bitching about each other to me um, and wanting me to pick who was you know cooler um, so that was pretty good um, to put that in hard numbers so it's like these like subjective things I mean I guess that's sort of a numbers thing but it's like oh well you can you can make things up um, so this is numerical outcomes and you probably can't read all of it from where you are but basically this was through the course of being able to re significantly reduce technical debt, increase automation, improve code quality, all these kinds of things. Before, at the beginning of the year, we had a situation where we had about three hours for a production deployment per instance. We had multiple instances of the product. By now, we actually have about 20 instances of the product. Um, we didn't back then, but it would have been totally unsustainable to do what we do now back then they now take 20 minutes for all of the instances to run the deployment because it all happens simultaneously and automatically. Um, instead of being 30% automated, that's 100% automated. They basically press a button and they go to uh, Starbucks. Um, time to create developer instances used to be five days. Instead, now it's about two hours. Again, most of which is just press the button and wait. Also for private cloud instances, the same thing. Uh, at that time, we were unable to do a European data center because of the sustainability of running multiple sites. Um, that's now something that we, we do. Um, and again, running that's the same sort of technical specs. And the reduction in uh, data errors is 98% uh, uh, reduction in data errors over that time. All of which, by the way, is 15% cheaper than it was in terms of our, uh, our uh, infrastructure. So not just sort of fuzzy kinds of like, hey, everybody's happy. A um, lot less money and uh, way better technical productivity. Um, and uh, instead of, you know, elephant seals, we've now got people who are um, like blog posts that I write. Used to be I wrote those sort of hopefully, now I write them because it actually happens. They're like a crew team that are actually rowing uh, together in the same direction and getting things done. It's a much easier place to be, much happier place. With that, I'm done.